Hi there everyone and welcome to another episode of Drinking with Dana. Um, thank you all for joining me. I I'm, uh, hope that you've enjoyed the show so far. Uh, if you have, let me know. Uh, give me a comment, send me a whisper on Twitch. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, leave a comment below. I'd really love to hear what you think. Um, let me know if you've tried any of the cocktails or other recipes that I, I've, uh, you know, done on these shows and, uh, and what you thought of them. I uh, did that first thing with the cheese puffs. Did I use too much salt? Did I not? Uh, what do you think? Um, anyway, today uh, we're doing a few uh, different uh, things, as we always do. Um, and sorry, it is hot today. It is very hot. And so, and I've got the oven on because I used up my good, uh, don't have to cook this uh, dish last week. So I'll have to find some more of those if the weather keeps up like this. Um, well, let's just get right into it. Um, and also if there are folks out in the audience there, let me know how I'm looking, how I'm sounding. Uh, you, the, the video quality, not a commentary on my outfit. I, like I say, it is hot here. Um, anyway, the first drink we're going to be doing tonight is a uh, basil gin smash. And um, it was invented in Germany uh, by someone named Georg Meyer at Le Lyon in Hamburg, Germany. Um, uh, and apparently got so popular in bars across Germany that bartenders started to referring started referring to it as Meyer's Curse because it involves a lot of um, basil muddling that they have to do, and it's always a pain. And then you have to get rid of the basil leaves when you're done with it, and so on. It's just, it's it's a little you know. I, if you're making them at home, it's no big deal. But if you're making them in a bar setting where you're rushing through everything. I can see how it would be a pain in the butt. Um, now, because it's a popular drink, uh, there are a ton of different recipes. I got this one from Punch uh, online, and uh, it, I've only made it a couple times, but it's been popular uh, both times I've made it. So I'm going to do it again for you all tonight. Um, so, start off. First thing we're going to do is put in a bunch of uh, basil leaves. Now, again, it, the amount of basil leaves varies by recipe. I've seen some call for like 12 or so. Uh, you could probably get away with less. Basil is a very strong flavor. Uh, and if you're muddling it, you're going to get a lot of that flavor out. I like strong flavors, so I've got about nine big leaves and a couple of small leaves in there. Uh, Basically, I was just pruning back my, my basil plants outside, so I grabbed what I felt like. And then a sprig for later for the garnish. Um, so, now, the recipe that Punch gave said that you just put the leaves in there and then muddle them. And traditionally, at least the way I understand it, when you're muddling things, you want uh, some sugar or some liquid in there, uh, or both. Uh, usually, you know, the sugar provides a little bit of grit to, to grind things up nicely. Um, and the liquid is basically what's going to catch all those oils so they don't just evaporate off. So I'm going to add an ounce of lemon juice uh, to this. Use my uh, handy trick here. Of uh, just putting the measuring or the the funnel from the uh, or strainer, I should say, from my bullet shaker into the uh, shot glass there. Hi, quality assurance here. You might want to lower the camera because we can't see what you're doing. Hmm. The camera's only showing you from here up, and when you look. The oh, light... uh, <laughs> thank you. And for those who hear that in the background, that's my lovely wife, Lori. Say hi, Lori. Hello. Uh, yes, I forgot to switch it over to drink one. There you go. Now you can actually see the recipe and follow along at home. All right. Yes. Uh, and for those in the chat, Random Girl is my is my wife. Uh, Repentant hi. How are you doing? Good to see you. Uh, and all right. 
So, an ounce of, uh, so yes, basil leaves in the shaker. Uh, shot glass with the strainer, uh, measuring shot glass, which is what I use for a jigger because that's how I roll. That's just how I, what I like doing. It reminds me of lab glassware. And I'm just squeezing these by hand because I don't want to wash the uh, squeezer, the citrus squeezer there. Um, and there's going to be enough alcohol. To, well, I wash my hands, but also there's enough alcohol to kill any germs. All right, and need a little bit more, so I'll use the other half of this lemon. Down here, and there we go. That is one ounce of lemon juice. I'm just going to throw out the seeds and any pulp that got caught there. And one last seed that doesn't want to come out. All right, put that back on there. All right, so lemon juice. Uh, wash my hands because lemon oils and such don't want to get all over everything. Um, and again, long-time viewers of the show will know that I wash my hands after everything because, again, spent years in the lab, <laughs> you don't want stuff on your hands. Uh, so, lemon juice and... Uh, Adding in, uh, oh, and hi, Ska. Uh, Ska's in the chat saying hi to Lori as, as you know, say hi. Um, don't know where I was going with that comment, but just hi, Ska. Uh, so, three quarters of an ounce of simple syrup. Need to make a new batch of simple syrup. Fortunately, the next drink doesn't need it. Uh, so, got in our shaker now. Simple syrup, basil leaves, and lemon juice. And I am going to muddle those. And that just, in this case, just pushing down the leaves, squeezing them a bit to get some of those oils out. It's going to tear up the leaves a bit. And that's fine. That's kind of what you want because that gets more of those flavors into the alcohol. And I tend to be a little vigorous and use a lot of pressure when I muddle, which is probably not ideal, but it's how I do things. So, and you can really start smelling that basil scent now. All right, shake everything off in there. And I'm just gonna set that in the sink for right now. All right. Now our booze, our aviation gin, uh, so, and again, other gins are available. You just want a London dry gin for this. Uh, anyone would work. I was actually going to get some dry fly gin at the store, which is a local brand, a local distillery that I really like, um, but they didn't have any, so I got more aviation. So, but again, uh, you know, just about any Gin will work with this. Um, you, you just want to make sure it's a London dry. That's one ounce. And two ounces. So, got everything in there. And before I go any further, I forgot to get out one piece of equipment, which is we're going to double strain this after I shake it, um, just because we don't want to get any uh, basil leaves in here, you know, little chunks of basil in there, because otherwise it gets stuck in your teeth and it looks really bad. So, um, and get a little bit of ice in here, our glass for later. And then some ice in here. And again, just some crushed ice, some cubes of ice. The cubes are good for aeration. The uh, crushed ice is good for cooling. And I'm now probably going to overshake this, but that's just how I do it. 
there's no real guide for how long to shake things. Some people say shake it until you know you can see ice crystals on the outside. Uh, I tend to shake it until my hand gets cold. It's you know it's what you like. You'll if if you start making drinks for yourself, you'll figure out what you like soon enough. All right, so we're gonna double strain this here. And double strain just means pour through another strainer, a little finer one this time. You don't want too fine, because uh, otherwise then it takes forever to pour things. And I've, again, mo I've moved my stuff out of camera shot, so hopefully you can see this here. I'm going to put it up on the cutting board so it's a little easier to see. Um, of course, now I've just about finished pouring here. But uh, anyway, so you're just pouring through that second strainer to catch all these little, I don't know if you can see that, but there's a bunch of little particles up in there. Um, and we don't want those in our drink, we want a nice clean drink that's not going to get stuff in your teeth. Now I'm going to add a little bit more ice to this just to fill it up to the top. Um, and here. and then add our basil sprig as a garnish. And there you have it, the basil gin smash. So, cheers. Um, should let me put it back here so you can see it nicely. Uh, there we go. Ah. All right. That is a still image from earlier. Why is it not? Uh, I have had so many problems with this back camera. There, I swear there's a drink there right now. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, you know what? We're going to go back to that camera. And I will just hold it up and you can see it. You see the nice green color there. Um, you know, just a very pale green. Um, I happen to have a, you know, I'm growing basil outside. So I just grabbed one of these. I wanted to get one with flowers on it, but uh, the usually when they get to the point where they have uh, blooming flowers, then they're about an, you know five inches tall and would be a little unwieldy for this drink. So, um, let's see. Uh, Lori says the best part of this show is that I get cocktails and food after it's over. Please encourage Dana to keep this activity up. Yes, please. Um, and then, uh, Repressed Imp says, uh, maybe Lori drank it, which I'm not sure what that's referring to, but, um, anyway, yeah, and, and she also says that it's very pretty, so, and Ogre, uh, Ogre Marco, thank you for following, how's it going? Good to see you, glad you could make it. Um, Ogre's an old friend of mine, and actually another incredible chef. Uh, maybe someday we can encourage him to do his own cooking show, but it would be, I imagine, a very different format from this. Anyway, I should probably drink some of this and let you know how it tastes. Um, mm, so yes, a lot of, of the basil flavor, a lot of... The gin is muted um, in it, uh, so let, let me start from the beginning. Um, first, I think I, uh, you could argue that, uh, this has a little too much basil in it or that I muddled it a little too much. So there's a lot of basil flavor. If you like a lot of basil, like I do, then this is fine. But, um, so when you first sip it, it's cold, you get a lot of the, the lemon flavor to it but it almost tastes, I mean, it's a citrus flavor, but it almost tastes more like lime than lemon. And maybe that's just the, the visual, the, the green color of it kind of fooling me. But it, um, yeah. and Ogre says that if he does a show, it's gonna be more food and, and less booze. Also, Daisy Redwoods, thank you for following. Welcome. Um, Anyway, so yes, uh, green color kind of fooling my brain into thinking that it's uh, lime rather than lemon, but still citrus up front, and then 
uh, that basil aroma from the garnish uh, is follow is is definitely there from the beginning, but also you get the citrus, then you get the basil flavor, and they both kind of, of um, play together nicely. Um, I, I'm not even sure how that how to describe how it evolves after that. You know, you get the you get the citrus, you get the the basil, and then you get kind of a mellow version of both together. In that same way that if you have a drink with mint in it, you get sort of that that nice minty aftertaste. This has a nice herbal, actually almost minty aftertaste to it. Uh, now that I think about it, it does remind me a little bit of the um, um, the French Pearl that I made on I think the very first show. Um, so it's very nice. I like it. Um, <laughs> Let's see, what can I say? <laughs> uh, Lori says, business basil in the front, party citrus in the back. Um, actually, there's, uh, Ogre uh, asks uh, if there's astringency from the gin, and really, no, not not much. It's all, all those rough edges are smoothed out. I mean, I, this is another one that, it's very complex, uh, a very interesting drink, but it's not, it's also very approachable. It's not, uh, spirit forward so you're not tasting a bunch of gin but the flavors of the gin interplay with the other stuff not in a way that you can pick out it's like um, you know when when you have in a band you know you don't always hear the bass but if it wasn't there you'd notice it kind of thing um, so it's yeah I, I let's see um, what else yeah Oh, you might also be asking, what is a smash? Because uh, uh, this is a basil gin smash. There are a lot of other kinds of smashes. Uh, whiskey smashes are one of the most popular these days. Apparently, back in the 1850s, when these were all the rage, uh, the um, uh, brandy smash was the first big hit. Um, and what a smash is, is it's a variant on the julep. Well, what's a julep? Well, it is, in theory... <laughs> Originally, a julep was a type of medicine uh, that was basically a tincture mix, mixed with some other things. Um, then it eventually became a cocktail because of a uh, poem, I believe. A poem or a play, I can't recall. Um, long story short, a julep is uh, a spirit, mint, and sugar uh, that have been mixed together and put on a lot of ice. A smash is basically a julep with less ice in it, as far as I can tell. And so uh, this is not actually technically a smash because it uses basil instead of mint, but it's still, you know, same family. Um, as David Wondrich from, uh, in his book Imbibe puts it, uh, a smash isn't really a julep but then again, a julep really isn't a julep either. Um, so, you know, what are you going to do? People are going to call drinks what they want to call them, even if it's not technically dictionary accurate. Um, so, and let me tell you, on a hot day, this is a lovely little sipper. Um, I mean, which is funny because the idea is that smash, uh, juleps are supposed to be something you sit there and sip on all day as the ice slowly melts. And uh, smashes are something to be, you know, sort of thrown thrown back and brace you, uh, be bracing. Um, but I don't know, I, I like this as a little sipper for the day. But that being said, let's go on to the cooking portion of the program. Uh, if anyone has any other questions, any other thoughts on that cocktail, let me know. I'll be having to do my best to answer them. So, um, the next recipe we're going to do, uh, the snack to go along with everything, it's one of the reasons why it's so hot in here, uh, I'm going to be doing ham and cheese pinwheels. They are uh, a lovely little snack. You can, in theory, make them up ahead of time but they're best uh, served fresh um, and I'm going to kind of walk you through it but you do need the oven on to make them which 
cleverly I decided to do. And not just on, but on at 440 degrees. So preheat your oven now if you're playing at home. And now I'm going to move to the next uh, slide, as Lori helpfully reminded me. Yeah. And for those who are new here, uh, this is the, uh, the subtitle of this show is also Cooking with ADHD. So, uh, all right, let me get the rest of the stuff over here. I'm going to need that later. All right. Oh. And so, this is... Um, this is a really simple, easy uh, um, recipe. It, all it is is puff pastry, ham, cheese, and an egg yolk to uh, coat it, which I'll show you in a minute. But you can make this, I'm, gonna just, I'm getting this all out in a, ahead of time. You can just make this uh, with any kind of meat and cheese combination you want. Um, the recipe I originally got it from is from this book. Uh, which is just a little, you know, uh, you know, handy, it's basically a gift book that you give someone who makes a lot of hors d'oeuvres, uh, and I don't know if I bought this for myself or someone bought it for me, but, um, in here they use, uh, brezoletta, uh, and I'm not pronouncing that right, uh, and let's see, yeah, it's basically they use a cured beef and, um, such as brezoletta, Bresciola? Ah, I'm, there's no T in there. Bresciola. All right, Ogre, you can tell me how to pronounce it later. Um, and uh, and they also use Rachelet cheese, which again I'm not pronouncing correctly, but I don't care at this point. Um, and I will care less as I drink more of this. Um, and I have actually made this recipe with those ingredients. And it isn't as good as just making it with plain ham and Swiss. Um, you can also make it with, you know, ham and mozzarella or any any sort of sliced deli meat and cheese that you want. Um, so that being said, uh, first thing you want to do is take out your puff pastry and let it thaw. Uh, if you buy it, buy it frozen like I do, uh, this is Pepperidge Farms because that's what they had at the store. I'm sure other puff pastry is available. And if you're a, uh, you know, if you want to go through it, you can make your own puff pastry. It is not worth it. Um, allow me to assure you. Um, so take your, your puff pastry, let it thaw. This has been out for, well, I think this has been out for a couple hours, but an hour should do it. Uh, and then you want to uh, put it on a um, cutting board or some large piece of plastic you can work on or you know whatever you, you want to work with. Uh, just lightly flour it before you put it down. And then we're going to roll it out a little bit. And it doesn't need to be that much, but just, just enough to kind of get it a little bit thinner try and keep it as rectangular as possible. Um, should actually have gotten out a tape measure to see what I'm doing, but it's, you know, it went from roughly, I want to say eight and a half by 11 to, oh, say 10 by 14. Sounds about right. And again, just lightly rolling it out here. Uh, then all you do is start laying down slices of ham. If you can, with your nails, get the packet of ham open. And if you, this is Columbus Applewood smoked ham. I got it at Trader Joe's. Other hams are available. Uh, you do not want uh, ham that's, uh, I guess they call it deli sliced, or, well, Basically, you don't want ham that's too thin. The ultra-thin stuff used for sandwiches is not great um, because it's just, it's so thin you don't really get any flavor when everything's said and done. Um, <laughs> yeah. Ogre says, 
it's not worth it. Truth, laminated pastry is a mess and oh good lord, yes. And uh, Repentant Imp says, uh, my roommate and I made our own puff pastry in university one time. Totes agree, not worth it. It was a decision guided by Brandy Alexanders. And yeah, that sounds about right. Uh, that is, that is, yeah. Um, all right, so all I'm gonna do is I wanna lay down these slices of ham uh, so that they overlap just a little bit. But basically we just want a nice even coverage of our puff pastry here. Lay them down whatever orientation that works for you. Um, we are firm believers in that you are the only one who can decide your orientation here on this channel. Um, that was a joke. Well, no, I mean, we do believe it here, but uh, also, you know, anyway. Um, so, uh, what you want to do, and I'm going to kind of tear this last slice in half, and I, I don't know if you're going to be able to see this, what I'm doing here. There we go. I think I've got it on camera there. Um, I want to basically cover the puff pastry, but I want to leave, oh, say an inch or so at the at one end, maybe a little bit more. Um, and that's because uh, of, a, of something you're going to see in a minute. All right. So, once you've got the, the first layer, the ham down, you're going to go in here, get your cheese out. Again, these are Kroger Swiss cheese slices. Uh, nothing fancy here, just nice square, well, slightly rectangular pieces of Swiss cheese. All right. And in my experience, if you do these the right way, you end up about three, well, you'll end up using about nine of these slices. Um, and you tile them down like this. And hopefully you have enough in the pack. Otherwise, you get out the emergency pack that you bought just in case this happened. Ha ha. Because you've had ADHD your whole life and this kind of stuff happens all the time. Uh, okay. This is the part on the show where... Oh, okay, actually, it's starting to go now. Let's say, this is the part on the show where Dana cuts herself. You'd think the na my fingernails would be enough to do this, but apparently not. <sighs> All right. So, and then there's the last piece. So, before we go any further, um, we are going to get out a small dish and separate an egg yolk into it. And let's see if I can do this without making a colossal mess. And I know you're supposed to break an egg on a flat surface. I always learned to break an egg on a the edge of something. Oh, actually, I have to do this at the sink because uh, there needs to be a place for the white of the egg to go. So, sorry about this. I'm going to have my back to camera, which is apparently bad. Um, anyway. Ah. Alright. So, wash the extra little bit of white off of my hand. Uh, that sound... That's not racist or any, anyway. Here's the uh, egg yolk, and we are going to add just a little bit of water to that. Just if you can hear the the sink going, about like that. Oh, uh, here I'll, I don't know if you can see there, but just a little bit of water, and we're gonna take a brush and sort of break up the yolk and stir this up. 
to make an egg wash. So, it is nice and stirred up now. You can see it there. Uh, always forget. There we go. <laughs> no. Lori says, uh, no self-harm in this cooking show, dear. Yes, no, I'm not, I'm not gonna break myself. I mean, yeah, except psychologically. All right, so what I'm gonna do now, well, here, I've got that prepared. I'm just gonna set it to the side, hoping that my brush doesn't go falling out. Um, and then we're gonna take the, uh, the puff pastry with the ham and cheese on it. We're gonna grab it by the end that we've gone all the way to the end. And we're gonna start rolling it up like a jelly roll or whatever metaphor makes you happy. And we wanna get this as tight as possible um, because that will make the end result look a lot nicer. Um, I will say I have done this in the past with shredded cheese because it's what I had on hand and that makes a bit of a mess but it can be done. That's actually what I have done this I think ogre when you've had it before that's how I did it. Um, so we're going to take a little bit of our egg wash and uh, let's see, can you see this in the camera? Uh, I don't know, oh, my hands in the way. Take our egg wash and just paint that little bit of end we left uncovered uh, and this will act like a glue to sort of seal our roll so it doesn't come undone. All right, so finish rolling it up. And now, back um, I'm going to turn it back sideways. And this is where I get egg wash all over my cutting board. So use something that you can wash easily. Because uh, if egg dries on something, it's there for a good long time. Uh, tempura paints, I believe, used to be made with, uh, with egg. Um, and uh, they last for centuries. So anyway, uh, all, we're, all I'm doing is rubbing some of this egg wash on the outside. And what that's going to do is when this cooks in the oven, it's going to keep it, well, it's going to do a couple of things. One, it's going to give it a nice brown exterior, but also it's going to keep the um, uh, puff pastry from expanding outwards and will expand up instead, which will make more sense in a moment. Anyway, uh, just rolling it to the other side there. You want to get this nice even coverage. Just like you're painting a wall. Alright. I think I got the whole thing there. Yep. Nicely done. Alright. So now and put this in the sink, wash my hands, and get out a cookie sheet. And then remember that you have a cocktail that you should be drinking before all the ice melts. Hmm. To steady your nerves, right? Anyway. Um, Get some parchment paper. Just get enough of that to uh, cover. I always turn it upside down just so that when it curls on the edges, it curls around the, the plate or around the uh, sheet. Um, then, one nice sharp kitchen knife, and then you start slicing bits off. Now. You're going to try and, well, it, it's up to you how thick you want to make these. The thicker you make them, the softer and chewier they are. 
uh, because the puff pastry doesn't, well, you have to cook them longer and then the outsides get a little bit more done. The insides end up chewy because the puff pastry doesn't get done. Um, if you slice them too thin, then uh, they kind of fall apart when you're transferring them to the, the cookie sheet. I think the optimal thickness is somewhere between a quarter and a half an inch, depending on, on how tight you've rolled this. I don't, eh, I've got it pretty tight, but not, you know, perfect. So, and I just do one smooth motion, and of course now it's sticking to my knife. Uh, that's the problem with letting your puff pastry thaw all the way, is it now it gets a little bit sticky, especially with the egg wash on it. And then just once you've got it, you just transfer it over to your cookie sheet, and then we will cook them. And the, the first one and the last one will be a little bit weird. They always are. Don't worry about it too much. Um, those are the ones that you as the cook eat. So no, you know, to destroy the evidence. Let's see. And you'll get about, I always get about uh, four rows of three on the sheet. So a nice dozen. And, uh, got a little weird. Um, if, depending on how thick you cut them, you'll make, end up making about a pan, uh, sorry, about two pans worth. So, you know, half of the roll is a pan. Um, these can be done up about, oh, I'd say a, an hour or two ahead of time. Uh, and then once you get them on the uh, plate, well, you can either get them to the point right before you put the egg wash on and put that in the refrigerator, or you can get them all on the um, cookie sheets and then put them in the refrigerator, which is actually the more, the better way to do it in my opinion, because then they're just ready to go. The downside to that is they take up a lot of space in your refrigerator. All right, so again, let me wash my hands because stuff all over it and all right um so here is my cookie sheet as you can see some of them are a little weird shaped uh but in general and they're not going to be round uh because you know it just gravity will make it so they're not round but that's fine they're still still going to be really tasty um so Oven is at 440. I turned on before the show. Uh, we're going to bake these for 10 to 15 minutes. Um, I, it'll probably take closer to 15 minutes, but depending on how thick you cut them, uh, it might be less. And there we go in the oven. That's I will do the rest of these uh, after the show, and they will go with our dinner tonight. So. That is that. And I have sorely neglected my drink, so what do you guys think of it so far? Uh, and Scott says, sometimes the weird ones are the best. That is a motto for life. Cheers. Mm. So yeah, even uh, after being in a hot kitchen, uh, you know, while I was making that, the ice on the drink has, has melted a bit, it's diluted it down a bit, still lots of, of strong flavors. Maybe the, the citrus is diluted down a little bit, um, but because it's got a big chunk of basil floating in it as a garnish, uh, still lots of that flavor, um, still very clearly a, a, a good solid drink. Um, so yeah, it is not in any way harmed by slowly sipping it over an hour or two. Um, so yeah. <sighs> but I've got to finish this before we get on to the next one. So how's everyone doing? Are you enjoying your, are you enjoying the show? Are you enjoying your, your week? Everything going well for everyone? Hmm. And while you type all that in the chat, I'm going to put the eggs away because, again, hot in the kitchen.
And I asked this earlier when... <laughs> Thank you, Ogre. Ogre says hot. I assume he means me because I'm vain. And Lori does an, an emoji, just a thumbs up. Uh, Repentant Amp also this time says hot with a W, so aw. Thank you all. Um, yeah. I asked before everyone got on, but has anyone tried any of the recipes I've, I've done on here? Uh, if so, what did you think? Uh, Ogre says there's a cooler weekend coming. Very much looking forward to that right now. Oh, and I, I take that to mean that he was saying that he was hot at his place, which, yeah, he's, he's not too far from here, and I can see that. The whole Seattle area is been boiling. I, I wish we could uh, head out to the, the lake later on, but uh, oh, Ska says that uh, she's better now, which I'm, that is, that is the goal. Uh, I, I, so I don't know if I've, I've talked about it on this show uh, before. I probably have and have just forgotten about it. But um, uh, one of the uh, inspirations for the show was a uh, old show called uh, it's like Cocktail Party or something like that. And the whole thing was that they had interesting people and through a cocktail party and then they had ca a camera going around. It was basically a first person point of view and it would go in on the conversations that the interesting people were having while having cocktails and just chatting like they would at a party. And uh, they would go from conversation to conversation as you know there were natural lulls and that sort of thing. And I've never been able to find it. It was a show from like the 50s or 40s or 50s. Um, and I just always thought it was kind of a neat idea uh, so I, one of my favorite parts of doing this show is being able to chat with people in, in the chat and, and, uh, you know, just like, you know, you were, you know, of course there's, we're not really quarantining, but we're kind of quarantining because of, you know, the pandemic and all that. And so we can't really do the big parties we used to have. And I, I miss all of my friends and all of you out there. So, uh, this is kind of my way to, you know, uh, pour some drinks for us and uh, you know have a little chat and be able to catch up and, and talk so hmm. <laughs> Ogre does clarify that I am hot but uh, it's steaming him it is steaming him limp here at 87 degrees yeah it is it is very we are, we in Seattle are not used to these temperatures because uh, partially because the houses are built to keep heat in for our long cold winters, and so uh, yeah, if it, it get we're it when I grew up around here, seventy degree you know the seventies were about as hot as it got uh, you know or rather you know. 70 to 80 degrees was about as hot as it got. If it got into the 80s, we talked about it for a while. Now, getting into the 90s and even hundreds is not unusual, and that's just weird to me. Uh, Ogre's wife, Mickey, uh, thinks that uh, the SNL, the Continental sketches were based... Oh, were based on... Uh, so... Uh, Mickey thinks that uh, the Saturday Night Live, the Continental sketches were based on the um, the show I was talking about, the the cocktail party show, and I would I haven't seen those, but I will have to check them out. Uh, I am way behind on my Saturday Night Live viewing. We usually catch Weekend Update on YouTube, and that's about it. And every so often, Lori will find a a good sketch for us to watch. Also, this is now where I realize that I never set a timer for those pinwheels that I put in, so I should probably do that. Uh, we'll check them in about five minutes. And if anyone wants to go back <laughs> and check the timestamp of when I did that, um, I guess there's no way to do that here. Uh, those on YouTube will know exactly how long I put those in for. <laughs> Sorry! Oh, it's been that kind of 
life, I guess. All right, that's not everything, but let's go ahead and move on to the next string. Uh, let me get this out of the way. I'll start moving stuff back. And put the and let's see. Now, if I were a real streamer and all of that, I would probably go in and do some video editing to clean up, you know, cut out all these bits where I'm cleaning up the kitchen and, you know, tidying things up between drinks and between, uh, you know, recipes and all that. But honestly, oh, and let me move to drink number two here, which, um, honestly, I kind of want folks to see that. I kind of want to see, oh, this is the colossal mess I'm making when I make this recipe. You know, this is, this is what I, you know, exactly how long it takes. And this is how, you know, exactly how long it takes to tidy up afterwards. So, I don't know. Also, I'm very, very lazy. So, there is that. All right. Okay, and actually, I'm going to probably take a couple more sips on that other cocktail, if there are those left, because there is some talking i got to do about this next drink. Uh, so, I have said before on the show that I'm not ready to tackle uh, tiki drinks yet, um, because tiki drinks are, by their nature, problematic. Uh, there, there is a whole lecture to get into, and I, as a middle-aged white lady from Seattle, am not really the person to give that, uh, at least not on, you know, show number three or four of my random YouTube stream. Um, there is a lot of research to be done. I recommend going out and looking into what people from Oceana think of uh, the of Tiki stuff uh, because it's a complicated issue. Um, at the very least, you know, drawing the line about what is Tiki and what isn't is complicated. Is it Tiki inspired art or is it just mid-century art? Uh, is it a Tiki drink or does it just happen to use some coconut cream in it? That's, I have my own personal definition, um, and it's kind of hard to articulate, but to me, Tiki evokes a sort of a fantasy or a exoticized uh, Oceana, uh, you, know, the, you know, the islands of the Pacific, that sort of thing. The very term Tiki is uh, actually stolen from the Maori, who, um, uh, it's the name of their sacred idols, yes. It's also the name of the first man in their religion, so it'd be like, you know, calling your uh, style of art and cocktails Adam. Uh, so it gets, there's a lot of weird stuff with it. My, like I say, my definition is it evokes that is exoticized fantasy Pacific Islands, uh, you know, Oceana in general. Um, and this drink I don't think does that. Uh, the hit, so this drink is called the Painkiller. Uh, so no exoticized, it's not, you know, you know, island punch or anything like that. It's it was made on an island in the Virgin Islands. Uh, so this drink was originally made by Daphne Henderson, an English bartender at the Soggy, Soggy Dollar Bar on the Isle of Jost Van Dyke in the Virgin Islands. And that is my reminder. That's been five minutes. So it uh, looks like these need at least a couple more minutes. So I can put them in there. Or call it uh, three more minutes. All right. Um, so, uh, 
so she made this drink out of her soggy dollar bar. The d soggy dollar bar was called that because uh, she basically fell in love with the islands and decided to put up a bar on the beach. And there's no dock there, nothing. So when the sailors would come in to this you know, tiny little hut on the beach, uh, they would have to swim up to the bar. Uh, and so all of the money would, in their pockets was wet. So soggy dollar bar. Um, and, you know, it does use sort of the same ingredients you would find in a lot of tiki drinks. Um, but it's also sort of the ingredients that, you know, you would find in any, you know, you would find in the tropics. They're fruit juices, you find those in a lot of drinks. Coconut is one big signifier of that kind of thing, but, you know, it's coconut. You use that in a lot of stuff. Um, I don't know. I, I could be wrong on this. You, it could be definitely considered a tiki drink. For me, it isn't. Um, another funny story with this drink, though. Uh, so it's traditionally made with something called uh, Pusser's rum. And I'm, again, I'm not pronouncing that right, I'm sure. Uh, Pusser's rum. But which is a recreation of the rum given to the British sailors up until the 1970s. Uh, so it's also called Navy Strength Rum, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, but uh, that's because uh, Pusser's copyrighted uh, the recipe for uh, this drink. Uh, I'm guessing they bought it off of Daphne at some point. Um, but the original uh, drink that when she made it was with uh, Cruzan dark rum and not uh, not Pusser's so but if you own a bar and you call a drink that you make a painkiller you technically have to make it with uh, with Pusser's rum or you can be sued and I've heard of uh, of some bartenders getting cease and desist letters because they make the wrong, they make the drink with the wrong rum. Um, we're not gonna make it with boosters today because I don't have it. Uh, we're gonna be using a lovely old Lahaina dark rum. This is one of my favorite uh, dark rums. Uh, it is lovely just to sip on its own. Uh, unfortunately, you can only get it in Hawaii, although I do believe now they finally have, have started shipping it. Um, uh, but basically, if I know anyone's going to Hawaii, I always have them bring me back a couple bottles if I can. Um, and once again, pinwheels. Let's see. All right, those look pretty good. Uh, they're actually getting a little, some of the thinner ones are getting a little too done. So go ahead and take those out. All right, I'm going to let those cool so I don't burn my hand. <sighs> All right. So that's kind of the story. Um, I'm going to talk a minute about the ingredients. Um, I'm going to turn off the oven here. Um, so uh, this drink. Oh, and I'm I'm sorry. Normally, I uh, make a habit of doing the recipes from least expensive ingredient to most, which is how you should build your, your cocktails. Uh, let's see. Um, oh, uh, Lori asks, uh, what rum can people use if they're not coming to or from Hawaii? Uh, any dark rum will do. Um, basically, uh, you want a, um, yeah, just a, a good, strong, flavorful, dark rum. Uh, and it will the the quality of the rum actually does make a difference in this drink. I've made it with both uh, Bacardi Dark and this, and these are much better. So, um, anyway, okay. So, uh, so yes, the the fruit juices. Normally, when you see orange juice in there, you're supposed to use freshly squeezed orange juice. I don't have time for that. And this stuff, I think, has uh, cal. No, the, I did not get the minute made with uh, calcium this time but seriously there are some things that are worth you know spending extra time and energy on some drinks the using freshly squeezed orange juice makes a huge difference uh, and if you want to try it 
you know, with that. Um, that's great. I recommend it. See, see if you like it. See if you can taste the difference. I'm just going to use Minute Maid because that I think that it's fine with that. Um, and actually, I'm going to build it. Nor, instead of just using the shot glass this time, I've got this nice uh, big measuring tumbler. Here, let me hold that here. It's got measurements on the side. It's got recipes on the side that I've never used because I don't trust, you know, I don't trust what this class is telling me other than the measurements. Um, and, oops, oh, some leftover uh, lemon pulp there. Um, anyway, uh, so yeah, I'm going to just build it all in here and then pour it into my shaker because uh, it calls for four ounces of something, which is a lot of measuring. Um, so, and two ounces, it, first, you know, anyway. Uh, so, shake up my pineapple juice. I'm using uh, Trader Joe's pineapple juice here. It is really good pineapple juice. Um, what I normally use are little cans of the, the little uh, Dole's cans of uh, pineapple juice, because you can keep those in your refrigerator and they last forever. Um, you will, you know, you all, always have pineapple juice on hand if you buy those little cans. Um, so that's why I normally use, I went to Trader Joe's, I happen to have some of the, the really good pineapple juice on hand and Lori hasn't drunk it yet, so let's use that today. And admittedly she hasn't drunk it because I told her not to, or asked her kindly not to. I'm sure she's going to get the rest of this. So four ounces, oh, that's a little bit over, but four ounces of pineapple juice. And then one ounce of coconut cream. Uh, so, this is uh, Coco Real coconut cream. It comes in this handy squeeze bottle. It is the best thing ever. Because normally coconut cream comes in cans. And so you have to open up the can and then scrape it all out into some bottle. And then you have to try and pour it out, but it doesn't come out easily. And so this is just really easy to use. I keep it in my refrigerator. Um, you do have to take it out to uh, basically warm it up. Otherwise, it doesn't uh, doesn't flow basically at all. It gets very thick. Um, but the easy way to do that is take a cup or a bowl or something, uh, fill it with hot water, plunk this in there for about five minutes, and it it's pretty much back to room temperature at that point. Uh, you do have to shake it up because it does separate out a bit. Um, and in case you haven't heard of coconut cream, or cream of coconut, technically, um, it is, it's not the same as coconut water. It, uh, coconut water is the water from the inside of a coconut. Uh, this is that blended with some of the coconut pulp uh, to, and some of the coconut oils to make a very thick, uh, viscous, almost paste. Um, so it's a very different thing. <laughs> Lori says she uh, may have just had some of the pineapple juice before the show. Well, thank you for leaving me enough. I appreciate that. So, all right, we want one ounce of the cream of coconut. And one of the other reasons why I am doing it all in the same glass, and I'm making a mess here, is that um, especially if it's a little bit cold, the uh, coconut cream will basically stick to the inside of your shot glass. If you put it in a glass that already has liquid in it, then it's gonna blend a little bit with that, uh, that liquid and not stick as much. Um, and because normally with a shot glass or you know, any kind of jigger or anything like that, you have to use your, your finger to kind of scrape it out or you know, a spatula if you have a spatula that small. All right, orange juice. We're gonna use an ounce of orange juice here. All right, so we've got pineapple, four ounces of pineapple juice, one ounce of coconut cream, uh, one ounce of orange juice in here. And now the last thing we're going to do is the two ounces of our good dark rum. Now the first thing you will notice uh, when I pour this in 
is um, it's going to make it look not terribly appetizing because this is a good dark, dark rum. Um, so it's going to end up looking a little on the brown side. There we go. Um, and I, uh, well, so that should be all of our, almost all of our ingredients. The ground nutmeg will save for a garnish on the top. I'm going to pour this all now into our shaker. And you see the coconut cream went right to the bottom. We're going to let that come out as much as possible. Um, now I would say up until recently, I thought there is one recipe for painkillers. Um, it, you know, most drinks that I'm gonna have on the show, it, unless there is like one person who's made it and I got the recipe right from them, it's gonna be, you know, like, you know, with any kind of smash or any, well, any kind of drink, there's gonna be 18 zillion recipes for it. Up until recently, I thought there was just the one from the painkiller and or from the soggy dollar bar and everyone knew it and everyone just kind of accepted that and moved on. Uh, until I had a friend come over a couple of days ago and uh, I was like, oh great, uh, I, I don't have my, my notes typed up yet, I'll just look up online, what's the recipe for this? And I got a different recipe and I didn't realize it till after she had left uh, and I was typing up the notes and I was like, this doesn't sound right. Um, and it was basically the same, just with slightly, I think it was slightly reduced. Um, for reasons which I'll get to in a minute, but um, anyway, long story short, Cynthia, if you're watching, sorry, uh, they were still tasty, but they were just not quite the same. Um, so, got this in here, I am going to, well, so, the glass I'm going to use for this is, you could call it a tiki mug, it is a, uh, it's from Trader Sam's down at Disneyland, uh, and it is the most non-tiki-ish mug like this that I've got. Uh, the reason I'm using it is twofold. One, it's the right size. Uh, honestly, uh, I tried like four other glasses, uh, or you know, I tried uh, the my highball glasses, which I, is what you're supposed to use, I think, and it there was tons left over. And then I used uh, my hurricane glass and it barely, you know, got a third of the way up. And then I tried a, uh, you know, just our regular water glasses, which are actually pretty nice. And it was like, you know, maybe half full. And this is, I tried this and it's exactly the right size. So again, despite the trapping, oh, the other reason is, as you know, as you saw before I poured it in here, it's kind of muckyish brown in color uh, and it'll look nicer once I shake it but it's still not the nicest looking drink in the world and this is opaque so uh, it works really well for that so uh, all right oh uh, what rum can be uh, it's a, uh, ogre says post COVID celebration episode we gather the friends and make a bowl of rum punch yes or a scorpion bowl or something like that. Actually, uh, so Ogre, it's your first time here. I have been talking about this for a while. I've got an idea for a, um, a show and it is the quick fire round where it's all like, you know, one or two ingredient drinks or just simple, you know, appetizers that I can make in like five minutes or less. And I just do them one after the other after the other and just like hand off the drinks as people come through and just supply a, a small cocktail party worth of people that way. So yes, post COVID there will be much rejoicing and many drinks and many appetizers and things. So I'm gonna put ice in here. Ah. And I'm gonna put ice in here. Right. I think we may be running out of ice. 
our refrigerator has started being a little bit stingy with the ice when it gets hot. So I'm not really sure what's going on with that. It's also, you know, probably me going in and out of there 18 times, melted all the ice or something. All right. And this you want to shake up actually really well uh, because it does have that coconut cream in there. You want it to really integrate with everything else and also uh, to get a nice uh, heavy foam on it. Um, so. Here we are. And it will come out looking uh, like a light chocolate milk. And again, you'll get that nice thick foam from the shaken coconut uh, cream there. Now, the last touch is that we are going to grate some nutmeg over the top. Uh, you can use pre-grated nutmeg. Um, nutmeg is one of those things where it really does benefit from being fresh. Um, this is just a microplane uh, spice grater. Uh, a jar full of nutmeg will last you most of a lifetime, um, depending on you know how really into eggnog you get at the end of the year. But really, uh, it's it it's a good investment if you've got the space and can actually and, and can do it. Uh, it's worthwhile. Uh, so, and there we go. We're just going to grate a little bit over the top. So, and then, now you can put on like a slice of pineapple or something like that for garnish. You don't really need to, especially if you're using a fancy mug or something like that. Um, so, since the back camera isn't working again, I will try and hold that without pouring it out. Uh, there, I don't know if you can see that. Uh, there. A nice foam, you can see the ice through it. See the nutmeg there on top and such so uh and like i say nice opaque mug you don't see the sort of brown liquid inside which is not really as cool as some of the other drinks it doesn't have that you know cool green color and all that uh the other nice thing about this style of drink is you can dress it up with all those little touch keys that you buy or the the you know and again, now we're starting to get back into the tiki culture um, or really tropical stuff, which is, um, you know, you can dress it up with the little plastic mermaids and the, you know, umbrellas and so on and so forth. Um, tonight, we're just gonna do it simple, just like this. So. Okay, first thing you get is that coconut and it's, uh, it's, you get a little bit of the rum in with it. Um, there's, it's definitely coconut, but it's a taste I always associate with just coconut rum, no matter what it's in. It just, it has that flavor. And in this case, it's actually coconut and rum. The fruit juices come later, um, especially the orange and pineapple. They, they have always kind of formed a bit of a, uh, a mix because uh, they're both citrus in a way pineapples weird in that it's always trying to kill you even after you killed it um, as Lori points out this is a very simple drink but it hits like a velvet hammer um, even well except that the thing is there's only two ounces of rum in this entire mug of drink so if you sit there, you know, and, and you can sit here and sip it for a while and get your, you know, daily serving of, veg, uh, of fruits and, uh, um, and here I feel compelled to make a, I'm a daily serving of fruit. Anyway, um, but it's a nice fruity sipping drink and it's not, uh, you know, Lori, I will admit that Lori is a lightweight, um, 
and which I love her. Um, although, well, for some things she's a lightweight. She can hold her own on like say brandy and other things for some reason, but I digress. This, uh, in my opinion, this is a nice approachable sipping drink for people who want something fruity, want something tropical, want something, you know, that's basically, uh, oh yes, uh, Ogre reminds me to check my, uh, so the pinwheels are out. The pin, I did take the pinwheels out. I should taste them, however, and let you know what they are. So, uh, here's one that, uh, so you can see, not, you know, get some light on there. Um, uh, basically, it's, as you can see, it's risen quite a bit. Uh, outside, it's nice and browned. Uh, the, the cheese uh, melts and crisps up on the top. So I'll take a bite here. Mm. And they're so good. Um, you get that nice crispy cheese flavor. Um, you can definitely taste the ham. That's why you want to use the thicker ha cuts of ham or whatever meat you decide to use. Um, you get that, you know, if you ever had a, um, uh, basically it, it, you t it tastes a little bit like a hot ham and cheese that's been cooked exactly right. Um, it's a little bit chewy in the center, but you get a lot of crispness on the outside. Um, it's a, sort of a three biter. So they, you know, the, the recipe only makes about two dozen, but those will last for a good while. Um, well, depend, you know, I say they'll last for a good while. People will just gravitate to them and just sit there and eat them quickly. It's, it's kind of like the deviled eggs in that regard. Uh, you know, people seek them out and are like, huh, what are these? Oh, and then they just, you know, try and eat them like chips. Um, hmm. Hmm. Oh, hello, Winter. Uh, it's Winter Nicole says that uh, the drink sounds uh, yummy and that she likes uh, fruit and tropical. Hmm. And so, um, well, I'm going to finish this first. You absolutely can use the uh, painkiller to wash down the, um, the pinwheels. The players do go really well together. <laughs> I'm now uh, debating the wisdom of a show where I have to, you know, talk with my mouth full and We have dead air while I just sit here and eat and drink in front of you. Um, so one thing I do want to note on the uh, painkiller is, even though I'm using a straw, the fragrance from the nutmeg does come up, and it does sort of color the the flavor. Um, you might not think that you know, like fruit juice and nutmeg, um, is a natural pairing. Um, if you're like me, before you, I started getting into these things, um, nutmeg was for eggnog and maybe a few desserts. Uh, but it really is, a, it's a tropical spice. Uh, it goes well with the fruit juices. Um, it really goes well with coconut. Um, highly recommended. So, um, let's see. Oh, there was one other, oh, there, so, here, I will say that there are other versions of the painkiller. I mentioned earlier there are different recipes for painkiller. There is technically a painkiller 2 and a painkiller 3. And the difference is, in a painkiller, you have 2 ounces of rum. In a painkiller 2, you have 3 ounces of rum. And in a painkiller 4, you have... Uh, four ounces of rum. Or painkiller three, you have four ounces of rum. Um, in my opinion, I've made the painkiller two, and it's okay if you want a stronger drink where you can really taste the rum. Um, but in my opinion, 
you know, three ounces, you know, I, I would do two and a half more than three, uh, and two is just fine. You do get a, <laughs> Ogre says, painkiller two, electric boogaloo, uh, which is, yes. Uh, anyway, uh, in the regular painkiller, you definitely can taste the, the interesting notes on the rum, but you don't get that alcohol flavor. Anything more than two ounces in that, and you're going to start getting alcohol overtones, uh, which is fine uh, if you know as long as you like that. But it becomes less approachable. This is a very you know this is a drink you can give to someone who says, "I want to try cocktails, but I've never really had one before," and they will love it. Um, and it's not going to you know it shouldn't knock them on their butt too much as long as they don't just sort of down it. Um, because it is, you know, it tastes a lot like just fruit juice, so you're like, oh, okay, I'll just pound it down because it's a hot day and I just, you know, got in from a jog or something. No, don't, don't do that. Um, uh, honestly, that first drink, uh, like I say, it was meant, originally meant to be sort of, you know, a thrown back kind of thing. Uh, the first time I made it, uh, I was hot and tired from doing stuff. And uh, I drank it a little too fast, and that, you know, even though it only has two ounces of gin in it, it's got a lot less else in it. And if you drink it fast enough that the ice doesn't have a chance to melt, it will, it will mess you up a little bit. Uh, this one, not as much. So, it is a very friendly, very friendly drink. So, so yeah, that is kind of what, I, oh! I do have a, a bit of promotion, that I, because you're already on this, you might as well hear about the rest. Um, first, um, I'm going to be on uh, the Transverse Network this Saturday. Uh, we're doing our Thirsty Sword Lesbians game on there. Uh, I'm a player in that game. Uh, we're at the end of our campaign. We only have this episode and one more left but uh, so if you want to witness the thrilling inclusion uh, it's a fun game uh, Jen our GM is a great GM all the players are fantastic uh, it is and if you've never played Thirsty Sword Lesbians before I highly recommend it it is a load of fun it's a tabletop role-playing game uh, that is exactly it's unabashedly queer it is exactly as gay as it sounds, um, but for a game that's about swashbuckling lesbians uh, in, in romance and such, it's surprisingly deep and kind of cuts to the core of various gay traumas and uh, is just really well written. It's won a lot of awards lately, and deservedly so. Um, I was a backer of the Kickstarter of it and have never been happier to have done so. Um, so we're doing that on Saturday at noon on the uh, Transverse uh, Twitch channel. And uh, please join us. Uh, the other thing I want to promote, just because I haven't promoted it on here before, is uh, Lori, who you met tonight. Uh, she and I wrote a book a long time ago. Um, and it's called Larks. It is a live-action role-playing game, um, and it is for street LARPs or for convention LARPs, closed room murder mysteries, whatever kind of game you want to write and run with it. It walks you through everything from deciding what game to play to recruiting players to you know writing up each character and so on and so forth. Uh, there are there's a setting as well as a bunch of cards plus all the information you need to write your own skills and abilities for people so you can use whatever setting you want. Uh, the only reason there's a little bit of tape on this one is because that's got, this is the old edition of the book that still has my dead name on it. Um, but if you search for uh, Dana Preby or Lori Preby on Amazon, you should be able to find it. Um, really good book if you like ro live action role playing at all um it could uh, in theory you could adapt it to a tabletop game we've never actually done that but we've used this system to run games for what over 20 years now 
um, although not recently because pandemic. But uh, yeah, um, lot, you know, decades of, of convention uh, game and street LARPs and etc. experience went into this. So uh, please check it out. And it's uh, again, it's called uh, LARPs or Live Action Role Playing System. And uh, if you just search for my name on Amazon, it should come up. So, and yes, Lori, uh, Lori says that we've been uh, using the system since 1999 and that we are old. And yes, yes, we are very old. Uh, cheers. So, uh, and Repentinim says, uh, can testify that you've run wonderful games with your system. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, we, we, uh, we've had a lot of fun running them. Uh, there, there are several I can sit here and this stream is now going to become the Dana, Dana talks about old games, uh, stream for a minute. So, uh, buckle up. Now, some of my favorites, we used it to run a, uh, Discworld game that went off perfectly. Uh, I ran a Leverage game. If you're familiar with the TV show Leverage, uh, well, if you aren't familiar with the TV show Leverage, go watch it. It was basically a show written straight for my heart. Um, very fun show about uh, criminals uh, turning into Robin Hoods. Um, but anyway, we ran, if you're familiar with the show, we ran a game with three teams, one of which was the security team trying to stop the other two. Um, it, it's useful for all sorts of stuff, and... You're explaining games that no one else has been to. I'm talking about different genres. <laughs> Love you. All right, apparently we sh uh, I'm getting the signal from Lori to wrap this up. Uh, here, let's go here. Uh, so if you have any last minute questions, go ahead and toss them into the chat. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to sit here and finish drinking my drink, and apparently, um, Two ounces of gin and two ounces of rum is enough to get Dana tipsy and talkative. Um, and also, uh, Lori gets to uh, go to a convention in a couple weeks, and I'm staying home um, because it's for various plot-related reasons. Uh, Repentant Imp says that she was in the Leverage Lark. I So who, were you, who did you play in that? Uh, remind me, and we don't have to go on on camera about it. But anyway, um, I hope you had a good time. That one went very weirdly, but that's a long story as to why. But it went well in terms of the system and all that. Anyway, uh, again, uh, thank you all for joining me. I hope you uh, have a chance to tune in later. I hope that anything I, I've said here may have been at least a little bit of help, or at least you had a good time hanging out and uh, enjoying a drink with me. Uh, I appreciate you being here. Thank you very much. Oh, and of course, uh, as always, uh, if you're watching on YouTube, like, subscribe, all that stuff that every YouTuber has told you since the dawn of time. If you're on Twitch, uh, please subscribe. I, I need subscribers to get to a point where I can actually do stuff. You know, if, if I get subscribers on YouTube, if I get 100 subscribers on YouTube, then I can actually have a decent URL to point people to, but right now I'm sitting at 16, so I could really use the help on that one. Uh, likewise, folks here on Twitch, please check out the YouTube channel. Uh, there's a link on my Twitch page. Um, if you're on YouTube and you want to come join us for one of these live shows, uh, I do them every other Wednesday on Twitch, uh, and that's Twitch, uh, www dot twitch dot com forward slash queen of no pants is my my twitch username there and again i would love uh, all the likes and subscribes and if you, there's something you liked uh or you didn't like uh or you want a a to you know start a beef with someone about whether ham or cured beef is better in the pinwheels please be my guest um all right uh, so, uh, 
Repentinim says she can't remember which character she was, but she was filthy rich and kept hiring people to get a huge staff. Oh, yeah, I remember exactly which character you're playing, but that's not going to help anyone else here. Uh, let's see. Uh, it's Winter Nicole says, well, I caught the end, but enjoyed the stream. Thank you very much for coming. Appreciate it. Um, if you want to catch the bits you missed, you can always see those on YouTube. I'll put them up right... Uh, I've got all this recorded. I'll put it up after, uh, after we finish up here. Uh, it usually takes about an hour to get everything uploaded and set up and all that. Uh, and Ogre is going to go subscribe on YouTube. And thank you very much, Ogre. I really appreciate it. Um, all right. On that note, thank you all for coming. I'm going to stop this before I yammer on way too long, which, again, too late. Um, but cheers. Oh, wait. Uh, oh, actually, what I need to do is see if there's anyone we can raid to. I always forget to do this. So, um, oh, come on, Twitch. Who's going right now? Um, it's not going to be another cooking show or anything like that, but if... Let's just... All right, the transverse is going right now, so I'm going to raid over to the transverse. That's where I'm going to be streaming this weekend. And so, let's see if I can get this to work this time. So we are going to head over to the Transverse. Uh, thank you all for coming, and I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Bye. Thank you for your help. But that's kind of how they end, uh, usually without the self-promotion, but... I, I know. It's just, you've had two alcoholic beverages, Honey. and I have no idea how much food you've had. And when I hear you start to tell gaming stories, I'm like, perhaps you should wrap it up, because my experience has been that if people aren't in those games, they don't like hearing about them. So, especially since I've... We worked our tails off. I think you had six people in the chat at one point. Uh -huh. I wanted it to be as close to a good experience as possible. Like, at the end, it would stop. <laughs> and it's your shield.